Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today we'll be discussing a case of a young woman who presented to our ER with complaints of worsening of ptosis. Can we begin, sir? Yes. A 59-year-old female presented to our ER with only complaints of worsening of ptosis. Our initial 10-second assessment, patient was conscious and when oriented. You, when you're telling ptosis, uh, yes, there are two reasons for ptosis. Okay. One is partial ptosis, and the other one is complete ptosis. What is partial ptosis? What is complete ptosis? Partial is when... Partial is partial. <laughs> what, is completely, uh, what is the difference? What is the difference? Most of the cases what you are seeing in emergency room is partial ptosis. Like if you take myasthenia or a snake bite, whatever it is, it is mostly it is partial ptosis. That is because uh, it, it, that type of uh, diseases we are seeing. And whereas in third nerve palsy, that produces complete ptosis. What is the main difference between this complete ptosis and partial ptosis? Levator palpable superioris and okay. uh, orbicularis both will be gone. So okay. there wouldn't be any uh, elevation of the eyelid okay. at all. That I understood. What, what is the basic difference patient will tell you? Diplopia. Mm -hmm. Okay, third nerve palsy you get diplopia, diplopia and completely most of the time they may not tell also. When you are examining they will tell. Because complete ptosis means he, his one eye will be completely closed. Whereas partial ptosis, he will try to open his eyes and he may not notice that diplopia because it's a generalized weakness. Okay. But unilateral ptosis, most of the time it is due to third nerve palsy. That, that type of patients complain more about diplopia. This type of patients, they may not have diplopia like other patients. Okay. So partial ptosis is the most of the time what we are seeing in myasthenia or... Uh, uh, snake bite, all, all these conditions. Okay. So, in our initial 10 second assessment, sir, patient was conscious and oriented and was able to speak in one full sentence. We moved on to the primary survey, okay. wherein airway wise, patient's airway in was. In a past patient present with bilateral ptosis, are you satisfied with telling patient is able to talk? Or just want to uh, go we a little bit. We want to ask about any dysphonia. You, you try to talk more, you try to talk more, you get more Beatness. information from talking itself. Yeah. See, one simple word telling properly will not rule out any conditions like snake bite or myasthenia graphs. You need to give some more time so that patient, allow the patient to talk so that slowly you can understand there is some difficulty in talking or the talking voice will come down slowly. That will, will give some clue. Okay. okay. In this type of neurological weakness, I allow the patient to talk little more. In this case, sir, patient was able to tell her own history by her okay. own self. Okay. So, without any change in voice, she was able to keep up the conversation for a long time. Okay. Okay. So, uh, there wasn't any change in the voice uh, or falling back of tongue or anything of that sort seen. Now, in breathing wise, patient had a respiratory rate of 19 cycles per minute, maintaining saturation of 98% in room air with adequate chest rise and excursions with air entry being bilaterally equal and chest was clear. Now, circulation wise, patient had a heart rate of 89 beats per minute. Why are you thinking about chest in this case? Chest is clear, you are told that you are asking. What is the importance of uh, So, if at all uh, patient has any added other muscle weaknesses, then that chest can... Chest will be still clear. Aspiration, if it aspiration. Patient, this type of patients like a neurological weakness patient, whether it is bulbar palsy or myasthenia gravis or uh, G, uh, the, what is it, uh, motor neuron disease, all this condition or uh, aspiration yes. pneumonia is one of the commonest problem and one of the cause for death is aspiration. So, whenever you get a case like this auscultated properly, the cause of death in most of these conditions are aspiration. due to aspiration, and the especially in ER. can also trigger the... Okay, the infection in lung can trigger the problem. Okay. Uh, so, with, with this, our circulation wise, patient had a heart rate of 89 beats per minute, which was regular in rhythm, with a blood pressure of 130 over 80 Are you satisfied with single reading of all these things? Uh, no, so repeated uh, uh, one of reading the, supplement. One of the problem in these conditions is autonomic, autonomic dysfunction. dysfunction. So, you need to have multiple reading, multi, multiple visible readings in monitor. All these things are very important. So, a single reading will not tell you anything. Okay, in examination, it's okay. But when you are managing the case in ER, uh, autonomic dysfunction is one of the most important problem which you are going to face in ER. So, uh, apart from this, uh, all peripheral pulses were palpable. 
Now disability wise, patient had a full GCS score of E4, V5, M6 and pupils were bilaterally reactive to light with symmetricity maintained with 3 mm dilatation every time Pupil light has got any importance in this yes, type of patients? Yes uh, sir, because if at all a third nerve palsy is involved, generally if a, uh, then the uh, any pupils weakness, will be involved. third nerve palsy is involved, one side pupil will Anisocoria be Anisocoria will be okay, seen sir, dilated. but when we are talking about other motor neuron disorders, myasthenia gravis and all, pupils are largely spared. Myasthenic crisis? Myasthenic crisis? Pupils can be involved. You will have um, dilation. Atriasis. Dilation. Dilation. Okay. Whereas in uh, this one? Cholinogenic crisis. Cholinogenic crisis. Okay. So in this patient, it was bilaterally reactive to light with symmetricity maintained. Exposure-wise, patient had a temperature of 98.6 degree Fahrenheit with a GRBS of 168 milligram per deciliter. Is uh, hypothermia good in myasthenia or bad in myasthenia? So uh, it, it improves patients. Cold temperature improves, improves the, the weakness, weakness. but transiently. Mostly it is transiently, not a prolonged effect. So. Immediately it may give some effect, but it will not uh, give a good effect, uh, effect for any patient in ER. So, uh, adjuncts to primary survey as such there wasn't any, but we can take an arterial blood gas if at all the patient has presented with any respiratory issues. Uh, because respiratory fatigue can cause PCO2 build up which can lead to type, one, type 2 respiratory failure. Yeah. Uh, in this case, ABG was pretty much clean and there was no uh, metabolic uh, derangements noted. Now, ECG was also taken sir, in order to uh, check for the rhythm and this patient had a sinus rhythm with no STT changes okay. of any uh, sort. Now, then our reassessment... Any degenerative neuron disease, what is the importance of ECG? Degenerative neuron disease, I am not talking about myasthenia graphs. That means somebody is having uh, like motor neuron disease. They also can have similar picture. What is the importance of ECG? Why you want to take an ECG in motor neuron diseases? It's a degenerative sinus. disease. Same sinus. type of degeneration can occur no, in the sinus, sinus nodes. The patient can have sick sinus syndrome, bradycardia, all these things can happen. Same patient can have similar finding in the cardiac Cardi system sinus. also. Okay. Uh, then on reassessment, sir, the vitals were again stable with 130 over 80 and other uh, vital signs were also pretty stable. So, we moved on to the sample history. So, in, in the emergency room, never tell single reading this type of patients. You tell monitor shows continuously 130-80. That is okay. Otherwise, uh, this patient suddenly can go to hypotension. So, it should be very careful. So, then in the sample history, the signs of the patient, signs and symptoms that the patient presented with was ptosis with verticular binocular diplopia. Binocular diplopia as in the patient only when he opens both his eyes, he will experience diplopia. But with one eye closed, there is no diplopia. Can no you get it. diplopia when one eye is closed? Yes, sir. Yes. Why? If at all, uh, there, there is any inferior orbital. Uh, that if there is a scar or injury to the uh, eyeball, it will produce yeah, blowout diplopia. Blowout fractures. And all. Otherwise, normally diplopia is bi binocular. Mm -hmm. Uniocular bi diplopia is a local Trauma. cause in the eyeball. Right. Okay. Neurologically, only diplopia will present when you have binocular Binocular. vision. Then, uh, other, uh, then apart from this, generalized tiredness was her other symptom mm -hmm. uh, and we specifically asked for uh, difficulty closing eyes, dyspnea, dysphonia, dysphagia, all of these were negative in this patient. So, with no allergy history, the patient... Uh, what else you, you can ask uh, in, to rule out progressive weakness? Any uh, fatigability, sir. The common presentation. Fatigability is okay, but that doesn't tell that uh, this patient fatigability can be there nor neurological or no, even a uh, patient who is having uh, weakness due to uh, hypothyroidism or hypocortisol. They all have fatigueness. Fatigueness will not tell you that it's a neurological weakness. Myasthenia gravis, typically you have to ask some important finding. So, after taking adequate rest, period of rest, like most of the time in this they in the morning. They don't notice all these things. Day they don't. They fatigue it in hypothyroidism. Towards the end of the day, they have worsening of the symptoms, Symptom. but in the morning, it is the pretty much most important symptom they are going to tell you. Generalism. One is uh, talking, you can, when you talk, you can see the progressively it comes down. Then you told ptosis. Findings, ocular findings. Ptosis is very visible and patient can also tell. Other important thing, every day you are doing this. 
Chewing is the most important finding. They will tell you, the patient will tell you. Slowly, they are unable to eat, like mm. they start taking food. Slowly, it comes down. That is the most important symptom patient is going to notice. Okay. Then, diplopia will be definitely one symptom. Other one is chewing. Okay. Then, uh, medication history. Actually, her past history wise, patient is a known case of hypertension. Mm. And uh, any, Does it got any importance in uh, myasthenia gravis? Hypertension. Blood pressure. It Again, it can worsen. It will not worsen the condition. What is important? We should know every aspect in this patient, whether it is good or bad. There are some drugs which mm -hmm. used for hypertension. Beta blockers, Beta blockers should, should not, not be, be given. Used. Calcium channel blockers should, be, should avoided. be avoided. This is very important. We, un, uh, we sometimes in emergency room, this, if this patient go to tachycardia, we may try to give beta blocker or BPSI, we try to give beta blocker. That should be avoided. Oh, okay. So, beta blockers are not good choice. Okay. If it is compelling indicator like an MI and all, we can give. So, uh, apart from this, uh, recently she was also diagnosed with ocular and bulbar myasthenia gravis. Okay. So, and it comes chronic in depression. Which grading of uh, myasthenia. Uh, so, uh, there is a classification called as an Osserman classification, which is graded into five. In that, the first grade is only ocular in movements are uh, ocular symptoms are involved. Okay. Basically, when a patient presents, around 15% will only have ocular myasthenia gravis. Okay. And uh, sometimes uh, within one year, around 78% will move, uh, will present with generalized myasthenia. And within three years, around 94% will present with generalized myasthenia okay. gravis. And they are classified as grade 1. Okay. Grade 2 will be mild muscular weakness. My uh, grade 3 will be moderate muscular weakness with involvement of oropharynx and Crisis. respiratory involvement. Okay. Grade 4 would be severe uh, weakness, like progressive worsening. And grade, grade, uh, grade 5 would be life-threatening crisis, okay. wherein the patient can go into respiratory okay. depression. Okay. So, this patient was in grade 1 because only ocular movement, ocular okay. symptoms were involved. So, it was more like ocular myasthenia gravis. She had not slipped into uh, generalized grade. yet. So, apart from this, she was also diagnosed to have chronic depression and undergone a thymectomy in the month of February and also had a recent COVID-19 exposure. That is, she was tested positive on 3rd of May and negative on 13th of May. Uh, Can these patients go for vaccination? Yes, sir. And My according statement. to va vaccination, uh, as far as vaccination is considered, patients are encouraged to take annual influenza vaccines. And, it's influenza uh, and uh, uh, inactive, pneumococcal. Uh, pneumococcal or inactive vaccines have to be taken, okay. but live attenuated vaccines have to be taken with caution, Why generally live avoided. Live attenuated vaccines should be avoided? Because uh, uh, most of the patients will be on immunosuppressive okay. therapy. That's so right, that not will, because of the disease. No. And COVID-19 vaccine is recommended to be taken. It should be given. It should be given. Uh, then uh, with this medication history wise, she was on neostigmine 15 milligram, which used to take four times a day. Pyridostigmin 60 mg again four times a day. Glycopyrrolite uh, 0.5 mg she used to take three times a day. Along with this, she was on statin, atorvastatin, and sertraline for her chronic depression. Okay. And Nebicard D for her uh, hypertension. Okay. What is the problem of statins in this patient? So statins actually can be given, but they have to be used with caution. Why? It's not contraindicated. It's as not such. contraindicated. But what is the problem? Uh, HMG mm -hmm. that. Statin Mind can produce myopathies, proximal myopathies. Sometimes uh, myasthenia itself can produce yes, proximal myopathies. Myopathy. That's why statin should be given, but we, we should be very careful. careful. Okay. Glycopyrrolate is given for? So that is to counteract the uh, side effects of pyridostigmine. What side effects? Generally, uh, pyridostigmine is basically an acetylcholine inhibitor. So, so basic patient Sandy can present and with and sludge. Increased salivation, lacrimation. It reduces all type of secretions. secretions. That's why py pyridostigmine, sorry, glycopyrrolate or in an emergency you can give atropine. atropine. So that is why she is on that. Okay. And then clonazepam and sertraline and all is for her chronic depression. Okay. So. Uh, then, uh, what are the side effects of sertraline in uh, sertraline tablet in emergency room? Sertraline again, excessive respiratory. Sertraline is basically SSR. SSR. Also, what what about serotonin syndrome? It can serotonin syndrome. Then interaction with other drugs. We interaction with other drugs. And sudden withdrawal can cause. Again, withdrawal can produce. Arrhythmias are very important. Arrhythmia, hyponatremia, all these things can be produced by most of these drugs. Okay.
So event wise, basically patient was on regular treatment, mm. developed generalized tiredness in the so last. So this patient develops arrhythmia like torsadi spine and all. How mm. do you manage because okay. of these antipsychotic drugs? Uh, and these patients, magnesium is contraindicated. Is so uh -huh. that is a problem in this type of patient. When we are using drugs which can produce torsadi spine, is we should avoid these drugs. Mm. Okay, when you are starting. When it occurs, it will be very difficult to manage yeah. because uh, ma magnesium itself can produce problems. Exacerbation. Okay. Of, yeah. So, uh, event-wise, patient presented with history of generalized tiredness since about four days, uh, and on and off onset acute onset of headache, which would be like self-resolving. And other than that, in the last three days, her ptosis, which she normally had, was worsening now. Normally, okay. as a normally for her, okay. as a ocular myasthenia gravis patient, that is left more than right. There was no history of nausea, vomiting, dyspnea, dysphagia, lightheadedness, seizures, uh, blurring of vision or uh, slow fatigued movements as such. Uh, other than this, she had vertical diplopia. Mm. Vertical diplopia. Vertical diplopia. So these were her symptoms which she presented with. Her bubble and bladder habits were normal and she was uh, adequately rested in the night, like normal sleep. Pattern. Since how long the symptoms are existing? Four days. So generalized tiredness since four days, no, worsening of ptosis in three days. The past four days. Four days. First time. No, she was no, no. diagnosed. For long time. That's what I'm asking. What is the past history? How no, no. Past since? history wise, she is a case of hypertension, sir, okay. with ocular and bulbar myasthenia gravis. Hmm. It was how not long? generalized. Sorry, how, long? how long she is? Uh, February she was diagnosed. What? Sir. February means? January, uh, February she was diagnosed. Six, eight years. Eight months. Six months. Yeah. Six months. And she also underwent thymectomy in the month of February. Okay. Uh, with head to foot examination, wise, so patient was moderately built and nourished with the height of five feet, five five feet and kg uh, seventy two kg body weight. Uh, no pallor, rictus, clubbing or cyanosis noted. Conscious oriented patient obeying our commands, and was able to hold the conversation for a long while. Okay. Now we specifically went for CNS examination, wherein I examined for her cranial nerve uh, system wherein olfactory the first nerve was normal second there wasn't any visual disturbances that she complained of and, and third diplopia is a visual disturbance uh, okay. diplopia that is vertical diplopia okay. she had sir and other than that in the third fourth and sixth there was like uh, no ophthalmoparesis as such noted but then in how the left they, if a uh, patient is not having third nerve palsy how do she get uh, diplopia so basically, if the medial rectus, a uh, superior oblique, all these muscles, if they are involved, mm. that can cause ptosis. So, so if lateral six, rectus, any, any, in any a, of the muscles should be involved. involved. So in this patient, the lateral rectus abduction was little limited, okay. and more ptosis was, uh, uh, more diplopia was noted in levo elevation position. Okay. So these were the sixth cranial. Sixth cranial. Last last. Okay. Then uh, fifth. Corneal reflex was checked for trigeminal nerve, which was pretty much normal. Seventh, no facial palsy, no buccinator muscle weaknesses. Eighth nerve was normal. Ninth and tenth, basically the rest of the muscles were normal. There is no that bulbar is, palsy. No, no bulbar palsy, yes. Sir. Gag reflex was intact. Uvula was centrally placed. Only ophthalmoplegia is there. Only ophthalmoplegia. Ophthalmoparesis yeah. and yeah. those were her uh, positive findings in the clinical examination. Otherwise, her motor system were in Pupil, bulk. Pupil is Pupils normal. normal so symmetrical normal. All these things are very important. Ophthalmoplegia is there, uh, tosis is there, but pupils are normal. normal. So, ocular myasthenia gravis classically presents as a triad of uh, uh, ptosis, ophthalmoparesis, wherein patient has uh, extraocular muscles weakness and orbicular, or, orbicularis oculi can sometimes be involved which will, wherein the patient will have difficulty to close the eyes. So this would be the triad that is seen in my ocular myasthenia gravis and in examination uh, wise patients every joint muscles was checked for power. That Another is the muscles apply your uh, eyelids, eyelids, eyelids will be open which, which levator palpebral superioris. Mm -hmm. And some fibers from uh, orbicular uh, Muller's muscle. Muller's muscle. Muller. Muller's muscle. Thirty percent is by Muller's muscle. muscle. That is sympathetic. Sympathetic. And the other one is by orbicular. Levator palpebral uh, okay. superioris. Yeah. So power wise, every joint muscles were checked for power, like for shoulders flexion, extension, abduction, okay. all of those. And then thighs again, uh, flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, knee muscles, 
ankle, external uh, hallucis longus, all these muscles were individually checked oh. and uh, joints were individually checked and power was seemed to be normal, like oh. 5 on 5 on all the joints along with hand grip. Which type of muscles will have more weakness, proximal or distal muscles proximal. in myopathy? Proximal. Proximal. proximal muscle will show more weakness than distal muscles in myopathy. Whereas in neuropathy, distal muscle distal. weakness is more evident than proximal. proximal. So, we should be very carefully checking the proximal muscles. Uh, and then reflexes were normal, sensations, all the other uh, rest of the examination was normal. Reflexes are normally normal or abnormal? Reflexes will be normal. It will not be affected, affected at, at, all. at all. But when the patient go to complete weakness, it will be flaccid. And then to check for the respiratory muscles, single breath count was, uh, test was done, wherein patient had a single breath count of 20. Okay. And then apart from this, now major complaint was stosis. What is the importance of single breath count? Uh, so, we have to continuously monitor it. It is and like see something like your GCS. Yeah. Okay, you document it today or, or now and after two hours again uh, recheck and see whether it is decreasing or not. Okay. Uh, so, uh, then in ptosis wise, patient had like specifically speaking about ptosis, patient had left ptosis more profound than the right ptosis. Okay. Wherein uh, left levitral palpable superioris was only 10 millimeters drop uh, and then whereas right was 13. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then um, other tests, bed tests bed, bedside tests were performed wherein uh, famously that is the ice pack test okay, wherein we keep that? ice pack for a uh, uh, couple of minutes and then we check for the patient and then we see for any improvement in ptosis. Okay. Now this patient had improvement upon mm. placing. Absolutely. Other muscle weakness will it improve? Uh, for a while, it will improve. It will not improve. Skeletal, Skeletal muscles will not respond to your okay. uh, this uh, cold testing. Mm. Only eye muscles, eye muscles will improve. Okay, that is the main important differentiator. Like suppose hand weakness is there, it may not improve at all. So only it is evident on the eyes. Eyes. And then there were other fatigability tests that can be done. So mm. wherein we ask the patient to either sustain a upward gaze. Okay. And then uh, we see if the patient is feeling any fatigue okay. or we can ask for a downward gaze where we ask patient to see downward for about one or two minutes and then uh, with the fast movement, that is the second movement, the patient has to look at a primary gaze. Okay. And then generally what happens is when a patient looks, uh, has a sustained downward gaze and looks upwards, then there will be uh, the levator palpable superior, uh, superioris muscle. Basically the patient will have ptosis and then there will be elevation in it. Okay. So, it will appear that the eyelid is twitching. It's called as a Kogan uh, twitch sign. Okay. So, these would be the... Now, this patient has come to ER with uh, ocular weakness. What are things you should rule out and how do you proceed? So, first would be to identify... Any patient who come... It's, we, suppose we don't know the history. This patient come to ER with uh, bilateral ptosis. What are the differential diagnoses? That would be one thing is like a stroke, uh, it can be a stroke, it can be stroke like where bilateral ptosis. Uh, we have seen cases like where a midbrain stroke okay. uh, right midbrain. at the center can cause a bilateral okay. ptosis. Bilateral ptosis. Then uh, can be myasthenia, myasthenia can crisis. be snake bite, snake neurotoxic bite. envenomation, botulism, lambert syndrome. Then yeah. some case uh, like we uh, case reports are that suggesting this neurocystic sarcosis, tuberculosis, all those uh, any brain oh. lesion causing such okay. findings. Uh, then. Tetanus normally they will not present like this. Uh, any this uh, toxin, neurotoxin related. Okay. Okay. GPS. GPS. Miller Fisher. Miller Fisher variant can present with okay. bilateral doses. Okay. So with this, uh, the better bedside test that we did was the ice pack test and the fatigability test which she turned positive for and ice pack test her ptosis improved after placing ice packs. Now uh, other than this we have to discuss about the drugs that exacerbate myasthenia gravis in an ER setting so, uh, of which many basically there are so many drugs that can interact so by rule of thumb any drug that is given to the patient they have to be uh, monitored for any worsening of the symptoms but majorly uh, known uh, um, uh, uh, drugs that are notoriously known to exacerbate myasthenia gravis would be beta blockers, aminoglycosides, uh, fluoroquinolones or any inhaled anesthetics like isoflurane, halothane, uh, um, then uh, neuromuscular blocking agents. 
ट्रीटमेंट but when it's given in high dose it can exacerbate oh. uh, myasthenia so it is only to be given in a hospital setting yes. high dose glucocorticoids uh, so apart from this there are many uh, but this patient came in with a diagnosed history of ocular uh, myasthenia gravis uh, but if at all we have to diagnose myasthenia gravis ice pack test can be a very easy bedside test other than that there's an ancient test called as a tensilon test or an edrophonium test where an edrophonium that is in 1 cc syringe about 1 ml is taken that is around 10 mg per ml and it is injected uh, intravenously or uh, say about 2 mg is injected intravenously and seen then we give a graded dose upside and then we see for improvement in the symptoms is it have anything in loaded edrophonium edrophonium should be loaded okay. loaded and kept sometimes we give it before hydroponium Like when we treat snake bite and all, normally we give, but neurologists normally they don't give. Yeah. They give atropine in graded doses. They wait. Then if required, they give atropine. So apart from this, uh, serological testing has to be done, wherein uh, estel colon receptor. Then out of our uh, our interest, mm. you should tell about uh, anesthesia. How to give anesthesia drugs? What all things are indicated? Contraindicated? How long you can continue the infusion? All this. Correct, no? No. Okay. So, sir, uh, basically, in uh, many anesthetic drugs will uh, have a effect on the patient's uh, Before condition. Before going to the anesthetic drugs per se, we <laughs> talk about what are the other things regarding the respiration, aspiration point of view, okay. and what are the things you will be taking care of. So, uh, sir, if a patient has to be intubated, um, which means to say the patient has reached the asthma classification grade five, wherein the patient has presented with life-threatening respiratory depression because of fatigued. respiratory muscles that is diaphragm is also involved so in that cases uh, serial abgs has to be taken to see for any pco2 retention or risk of aspiration has to be kept in mind because if it's a generalized myasthenia then bulbar muscles will also be involved wherein this uh, patient will ultimately end up with aspiration so in this case uh, uh, when we are planning for intubation then uh, like i mentioned sir we, there are be certain drugs which have which we have to take into consideration the as the most important thing two things one is what is the respiratory status already mm -hmm. see there is a continuous adequate excursion or mm -hmm. there or not mm -hmm. suppose the pre oxygenation you want to administer oxygen so for the initial few breaths patient where tidal excursions will be all right and slowly he will be deteriorating mm -hmm. so if under service you are noticing you may allow the patient to go for hypoxia so it's a constant thing unlike in other patients who are breathing spontaneous you are keeping a mask and then you are doing other works here we have to continuously monitor yes. number 2 regarding the aspiration part mm. see if there is any bulbar palsy or anything or there is a lot of secretion for example this patient is on neostigmine then so these things may be causing secretions also whether they can able to manage their own secretions adequately always we have to position the patient and keep suction prior suction also we got to apply and then. so these are all the two things you have to keep in mind next drug selection for pre medication uh, as an uh, glycoparalyte can be taken so in order to drive the secretions and reduce mm. the risk of aspiration again so um, since many anesthetic agents interact and exacerbate like inhaled anesthetics cannot be used glycoparalyte is available and Maybe I'm using it. No, no, I am asking. Oh, yeah. But it, oh, it is available in India. Vial. Vial. How many cc? One two mg at all. Vial. Each mg only contains the available sir. Ampule. Yeah, one vial. One vial. One one mg. It contains one mg. One ampule contains point three point three. Point two. Three mg no. Point two. Three mg point six. Point six. It contains point six mg. Mm -hmm. so you should be very careful what is the dose 
each vial contains and we are we are taking a medicine we should know how much it contains because mm. sometimes you are treating a young boy whose body weight is very low you have to calculate the dose and um then uh, yeah neuromuscular blocking agents are also the other for neuromuscular blocking agents what which one sedative. pardon uh, in um, for the sedative induction agents induction ah, agents you need to go for neuromuscular blocking okay. agents propofol is what is recommended sir okay. uh, then there is something called as a total iv anesthesia wherein we give combination of propofol and rumafentanil hmm. so uh, this is Uh, preferred for patients with myasthenia gravis. So, provided the cardiovascular stability, stability. is there, always mm. accordingly we have to go for the drug selection. Okay. What happens if you are selecting a ketamine? What is important? Ketamine Problem again. Problem with ketamine. Tachycardia. 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 See, it itself will increase the secretions. Secretions. Okay. See, throat secretion, salivation, increase salivation. So, already there may be secretion in addition. Next, so another option for uh, induction agent. Propofol. Propofol. Propofol two milligram per kg is given, hmm. and uh, rumafentanil in combination. What about etomidate? Etomidate. Pardon? Etomidate can be given. We can use it. Etomidate can be given. Okay. So next, in etomidate or propofol, we will be combining with analgesic. Analgesic. So commonly we are using fentanyl. Fentanyl. So the dosage of the uh, drug should be reduced, reduced, and we should be slowly administered. Over a period of at least sixty to ninety seconds, only slowly watching the response of that. How the sedative drugs will be, uh, have its effect on myasthenia gravis patients? So sedatives like uh, benzodiazepines and all can uh, exacerbate respiratory depression. See, all the sedative drugs, most often except the ketamine, all will have the depression over the respiratory center. So the, already the patient is compromised with muscular problem. So the, in addition, the, the center also will be depressed. So respiration will be suddenly going for inadequate. So all opioids and benzodiazepines have to be used with caution. Oh. So such patients always select shorter acting drugs. Don't go for long acting drugs. Okay. Ah, uh, so rumafentanil can be used, sir, in dosages hmm. of three to five microgram per kg. A okay. uh, total IV anesthesia, like I mentioned, would be a combination of propofol and rumafentanil. Then, um, apart from this, when we come to the uh, paralytic agent neuromuscular blocking agents are generally avoided in this patients because it can again exacerbate myasthenia gravis issues and succinyl colon is what is used and it is more than the so normal dose so if you are avoiding dose. totally neuromuscular blocking how will you intubate how will you intubate the patient you are planning succinyl, for an RSI succinyl colon sorry sir you are planning for told an RSI, RSI. Ah. so neuromuscular the, agent should be agent should be clear See if the paralysis already existing paralysis is deep enough. The disease itself is causing adequate paralysis. Then you can consider whether to administer further muscle relaxation or sure we can not. go about only with the induction agent and analgesic agent. Mm. There are certain situations where it will be sufficient. We need not have to supplement with this one. Okay. Next, out so of uh, sectional colon and another one. You are able to tell. I mean, you can just start it, no? What type of relaxant you would be using? What are its effects? Much dosage? The neuromuscular blocking agents won't be used, or uh, like rocuronium, or uh, vecuronium, or that cannot the be. Problem. Uh, Sorry, sling. You give with caution. See, in uh, this patient, this patient he is not having any adequate paralysis of the throat uh, or the neck. Are they respiratory muscles, mm. the laryngeal muscles? Only pertaining to this one. Mm. Suppose this patient needs an intubation for some cause, we have to definitely use muscle relaxation. Okay. Mm. So in, the, in that, which group of muscle and depolarizing agent or non-depolarizing oh. agent you will select? A depolarizing agent is what is selected. Non so what is depolarizing agent? Suction colon is depolarizing. Mm. Our other drugs mostly are non-depolarizing. See, and only two things in the muscle relaxation. So, one the muscle relaxation may be either sensitive or it will be resistant. As such, see, resistant means we have to use the increased dosage. See, sensitive means we have to use in smaller dosage. That's all. 
okay this will be sensitive sensitive more sensitive so another thing you have to keep in mind is whether the patient is on drugs like neostigmine thing because at the end of a non depressing muscle reaction usage you will be reverse the effect of non depressants only with the neostigmine so already the reversing the effect is there theoretically you may think that you may require more dosage of non depressant but it is not so okay this is the main thing you get to uh, know about it Okay. So patients who are on neostigmine sugamatex is used. Pardon? Patients who are on neostigmine sugamatex is what is used most. Hmm. No, no, sugamatex is for, for complete procuronium. reversal. Ah. So any of we are going to keep the patient, our patients not immediately off an hour, one hour hmm. procedure. They may be on prolonged ventilation. If we are going for a short procedure with intubation, then anesthetist will be taking care. Okay. So the in addition, the drugs like neostigmine will be. How they are acting? Acetyl. They are called anti-cholinesterase drugs. Inhibitors. So yeah, cholinesterase, which mm. is destroying the acetylcholine, mm. inhibited. So it will not only inhibit the true cholinesterase; it also um, um, inactivate the pseudo-cholinesterase. Mm. So what is the role of pseudo-cholinesterase in scolin? That is what that is, is used to metabolize. That is the main thing which will be hydrolysis. Hydrolysis. Right. So you may be theoretically again. You may be expecting prolonged action when you are using the section coding, but this is also only theoretical. But in clinical, we are not coming across this one. So, okay, so better to use the non-depolarizing action in smaller dosage. Okay, that's better. Okay. Okay. This is a female patient. Suppose this patient is pregnant. What are the problems you anticipate? Anticipate in India? Sir, uh, in pregnancy, um, it is majorly the first and the second trimester of pregnancy that can exacerbate myasthenia oh. gravis. Sir. um so again in should avoid some drugs which i must what are the major problems in pregnancy hyperemesis complications yeah hyperemesis mrc and the gravid error and the anesthetic can be certain drugs that anesthetic can precipitate What is the treatment of epilepsy? Epilepsy, oh, uh, eclampsia, eclampsia, epilepsy, magnesium, magnesium sulfate. That should be avoided. Avoid. Oh, Control the seizure. Then, then so. Okay. You cannot use phenytoin. You cannot use uh, magnesium. Short acting. Other cancer. drugs. Phenobarbital can be tried, but not a very good choice. But levetiracetam or something. And antihypertensive like beta blockers are uh, avoided. So you should be very careful when you are managing a pregnant lady. Then okay, one important thing is in ER we have to find out whether the patient is in cholinergic crisis or myasthenic crisis. How do you differentiate? Sir, um, basically if the patient has an overdose of any pyridoxine or neostigmine, oh. patient can land up with cholinergic crisis. We don't crisis. know. The patient come with oh. the problem. So how do you? I I movement uh, a pupil size sir in cholinergic crisis there will oh. be reduction or oh. uh, meiosis whereas the. Uh, Uh, my stenia crisis will be midriasis okay. seen so if you atropine that will become dilated for the crisis okay then you know uh, other other clinical increased issues. secretions everywhere increased, so, secretions increased saliva uh, cholinergic oh, crisis cholinergic salivation okay. lacrimation urination okay. abdominal pain is seen again cholinergic crisis breathing difficulty is seen both both my stenia other one abdominal pain mm-hmm. may increase the problem in the breathing, breathing. Okay. Oh. anything else When we do a hydrophone test, okay. myasthenic crisis will improve, improve, but coronary crisis will worsen. And hot as hair, all that. Radicardia. 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 Not as important thing. It is something like your uh, uh, OP poison. Mm-hmm. The clinical picture is like OP poison. All secretions are increased. Radicardia is there. Abdominal pain is there. All these things similar finding. So what happened to this patient after finding? um this patient was given a uh, pyridoxine basically for symptomatic management pyridoxine can be given sir uh, but that is not usually used for a um, it will not resolve the whole issue What but symptomatic this patient is uh, not on anything so since it's only ocular myasthenia gravis and okay, thymectomy is done otherwise glucocorticoids can be used preferably prednisolone which is given initially as 10 to 20 mg per day and then over a period of time the this dose is hiked up this patient we can give pulse also pulse yeah that is also given methyl prednisolone pulse glucotherapy other drugs like other therapy if at all that you want to go for non steroidal immunosuppressive uh, okay. agents are mycophenetyl okay. uh, mofetil uh, cyclosporin azathioprine yeah cyclophosphamide 
but then these have again their own side effects. IVIG or plasma pheresis. So that's all in emergency room. You have to treat only emergencies. Other antibodies testing and all, it's a different issue. They do anti must so many other antibodies. So the pregnant patient, suppose the patient is in labor, mm. what will be the problem to anticipate? Um, fatigue again, uh, you, you, um, so they have to bearing down, bearing, uh, they have to exert for the muscle activity. So sometimes over a period of time suddenly she cannot do it. Mm. So the patient normal delivery may not be possible. Okay. This one you have to anticipate. Yes, sir. And plasma paresis, mm. how does it act, what is its role? So plasma pheresis is basically uh, it, within a, within one to seven days the action comes in, wherein three to five liters of plasma is exchanged with albumin, and this is done around three to four times. So what so happens for one, during plasma? So pheresis? Uh, it, it, it only removes the acetylcholine receptors. Receptor anti antibodies. Anti anti uh, receptor antibodies. Antibodies. Yeah. Anti yeah, anti antibodies. Yeah. So transient help only yeah. if you are planning for surgery and etc. Sir. And then the newborn. Mother is myasthenic crisis. Mm -hmm. See uh, whether the child will also have the myasthenic crisis. Runs into it can the patient can Absolutely. have congenital crisis. What crabs. is the percentage of mothers with? Nearly 10 to 15 percent of the mothers with myasthenia crisis, the children may be having. Most often it will be for a transient period of two Antibody. to three weeks. Then it may be settling down. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much.